We have this week uh, the upcoming holiday of Rosh Hashanah, a two-day holiday. And I wanted to give like an overview of the various themes, the mitzvos of the, the of these special days, and to uh, give an overview in a way that hopefully will make our experience of Rosh Hashanah more meaningful and more beneficial. So the first thing to note is that Rosh Hashanah is a day of judgment. It's called the Yom Hadin. According to Jewish sources, on this day, the Almighty judges every single person in the world, and a judgment is inscribed in one of three books. And also, this kitch starts what's known as the Aseris Yimei Tshuva, the 10 days of repentance. There's 10 days from the first day of Rosh Hashanah until the culmination, the most significant day of the Jewish calendar of Yom Kippur. That's 10 days. One's the first day of Tishrei, and one is the 10th day of Tishrei. And these are the 10 days of repentance, where the whole theme uh, of these of this time is self-examination, examination of your character, of your priorities, of what you're living for. It's it's very significant days where you have this revisitation of what life really is all about. And it's interesting, and we'll get into this a little bit later on, that Rosh Hashanah is the first two days of the 10 days of repentance. But if you actually look in the prayers and the liturgies and the themes of the holiday of the festival, we don't talk about sin. As opposed to, you go to Yom Kippur, which is the final day of the 10 days of repentance, the 10 days of Sarasim made Tshuva, 10 days of Tshuva. And on Yom Kippur, we mention a lot of sins, and it's a repeating a theme of, uh, a repeating refrain of Yom Kippur. We say it 10 times, it's called the al Khait prayer, which means upon the sin. And we strike ourselves in the chest. We say, Hashem, Rebaganu, we're guilty. And then we list 44 different sins and different types and categories of sin that we're liable, we're guilty of, and we try to repent. So it's interesting, something to observe. It's intriguing that we have two days, really it's 10 days of repentance. And Rosh Hashanah is a very different kind of repentance than Yom Kippur is, and maybe than we're used to, because... There is repentance absent sin. So that's another thing to keep in mind when you go into Rosh Hashanah. And more broadly, uh, with the theme of the prayer, it's, it's not sin per se, but it's the idea of God's kingship. Like we start the morning prayer with the famous word, Hamelech, the king. Every time we say the name of God as God is a king, we always accentuate that. Uh, there's 10 verses in the Musaf prayer that are called Malchios, which refers to God being a king. And I want to try to give a, an, an overview of the whole holiday, where it comes from, uh, what it, what all these themes mean and how they interconnect and interrelate. Try to find out what the underlying theme of the festival is and how we could have a more meaningful Rosh Hashanah. So with any Jewish holiday, you have to always go back to find out what is the source of the day. You know, when was the first Rosh Hashanah? And you find out what was happening then, and that will give you tremendous insight into what's happening on that same day when you revisit that. And the idea being is that we don't look at time as being linear. It's more like a cyclical. And therefore, the year is, is, is a cycle, and we revisit the same location, the same spiritual station at that same time of history. So therefore, Pesach, which is on the 15th day of Nisan, the month of Nisan, well, that was the time that we had Exodus. And there was a certain spiritual energy at play that contributed to the Exodus. And therefore, the festival of Pesach, it's not just that we happen to memorialize it on the same day that it happened. Rather, we are recreating the experience. We are living through the spiritual experience that was present at the time. And it's a kind of a deep idea. But the point is, is that what the, the festivals are not about reflections on the past per se, but they're rather opportunities for the present. And there was an opportunity present at the Exodus, and that spiritual reality, that spiritual vitality that enabled whatever happened in Exodus to happen, that is still present 
on that day. And therefore, every year we revisit the same spiritual station and we're able to garner the same spiritual power. And thus we have a whole holiday, a whole festival oriented at trying to capture and maximize that day. So so Pesach, uh, Passover, you mark the Exodus. Shavuos was the anniversary of Sinai. And we have the whole holiday festival surrounding that. When was the first Rosh Hashanah? So a lot of people think erroneously that Rosh Hashanah is the first day of creation. And that's not true. According to Jewish sources, the first day of creation was the 25th day of Elul. And thus Rosh Hashanah is the sixth day of creation. And that is the birthday of mankind. You go to Genesis and you read that on day six, day six of creation is when Adam and mankind arrive. And therefore, there was something really powerful at hand at the original Rosh Hashanah, the first day of the existence of man uh, in Genesis, and that creates a certain spiritual power that we revisit. Now, I think kind of to step back and to, to try to answer that question, what was there? What What is the advent of Adam, what does that symbolize? I want to kind of take a step back and explore uh, a question that is maybe the first one to probe after someone accepts the notion of a divine creator. Once people accept the idea that an intelligent creator created the world Immediately, they have to try to ask the next follow-up question that results, and that is why. Obviously, if there was an intelligent being, they created the that that created the world. Intelligent beings act intelligently, and act purposefully, and act meaningfully, and don't act needlessly, and therefore, the world, the implication. The immediate implication of the world being created by an intelligent creator is that the world has a purpose. There is meaning to the creation. And that's sort of the, so to speak, the second tier, the second order effects of, uh, of God is that what's purpose? So we say that purpose is, is Torah or it's captured in the Torah. But on a more basic level, all Jewish sources, and it's maybe it's also intuitive, but everyone agrees that the subject of God's purpose is man. The Talmud tells us man was created last after six days of creation because man is the purpose of God's creation. And therefore, first you set up everything else, which is ancillary which is only there to service the purpose, you set the stage for meaning, for purpose, for man. And only once the stage is set, once everything is ready, only then do you usher man in. Well, so man is clearly the subject or the reason, the focal point of creation. But what's specifically about man uh, is uh, is this meaning? What about what does man need to do or what does man need to exhibit or what does man need to receive to accomplish this purpose? And if you look at the Jewish sources, you'll find that this very important question, there's different answers, which maybe is troubling. You look, for example, at Ramchal, Rabbi Moshe Chaim Lutzata, who's one of the authorities on Jewish philosophy and he's written many, many books, and uh, he begins three of his books with the same with the same premise, and that is that the objective, the goal of God's creation of creating the world, is to give man pleasure and to benefit mankind, and therefore man is here to be a receptacle of God's goodness. That's the idea. It's a common idea. Uh, in Jewish philosophy. Now, how does man get that goodness? That's, of course, through Torah. Torah is the key to unlocking the divine goodness 
that is the objective of creation. That's what Ramchal says. And there are other sources that support that. Uh, the Rambam says that. Maimonides says that. It's an accepted idea, principle of Jewish of Jewish uh, theology, of Jewish belief, is that God created the world so that God can give goodness to man. And man has to be worthy of it, and that's the whole idea of bread of shame, but that's a separate point. So that's Exhibit A. The problem is, is that there's a verse in Isaiah which says, which asks the same question, why did God create everything? And gives a different answer, that God created it to for his honor and for his glory and for his kingdom. And that's why he created everything. And that kind of has a God-centric angle to this question. And Ramchal is providing a human-centric angle to the question. But the truth is, is that these are really one and the same. Uh, I'm going to try to reconcile this, and it all comes together. It all meshes on Rosh Hashanah and on the original Rosh Hashanah. The Gona Vilna, he writes that God is all-powerful, and God has no limitations. That's the basis of Jewish theology. But there is a distinction between the two different kinds of sovereignty that God could have. God could be a ruler and the subjects are just beholden. They're subject to what he wants. You know, he's a, he could be like a dictator, totalitarianistic ruler. And God is the ruler, whether we like it or not. There's no way for us to unshackle, unburden ourselves of God's dominion. However, there's another kind of ruler. It's called a king, as opposed to a moshel. A king is someone whose subjects nominate him to be their master. And that's a higher level of a kingdom. And the idea here is that God always before creation of the world, was a Moshe, was a ruler, and had all the power. But there was one thing that was missing. By definition, there was no one who could potentially, or nothing, that could have potentially questioned that idea. It wasn't possible in the world, or in the stratospheres, to have anything that could have resisted or rejected the notion of God's dominion. There was no independent entity that could freely choose to accept God as king or to reject God as king. And therefore, the Almighty created the world and created a human. And a human has free will. And free will means that a human can choose on his own, independently, whether they want to accept God or to reject God. And if a human accepts God and a human has the ability to reject God, well, what does that mean? That means that there's almost independent verification of God's dominion and God's kingdom. And that is an expansion. It's an augmentation of God's kingdom because now it was, it was recognized by, so to speak, an independent source by man. That's a little bit of a deep idea, but the, the, let's bring this back to our point. Adam, well, Adam had free will. And how God creates Adam with free will is a separate question. So that, that's even a more advanced uh, theological question, theological dilemma. But Adam has free will, and Adam is capable of accepting God or rejecting God. Should Adam, should humanity accept God's dominion and God's kingdom willfully, independently, not because they're coerced, but because they choose, that's changing God, so to speak, from being a Moshe, from being a ruler, a dictatorial ruler, to being a Melch, to being a benevolent king. So that's the fulfillment of the verse of Isaiah, that God created the world so that man can choose God as their king. From the man's perspective, this same exercise results in man receiving benefit. When a person accepts God and all that that entails, 
that is the key to grant that person that goodness that God wants to give to us. So that's from Chal. And the verse in Isaiah are really two halves of one whole. They're describing the same process that is the purpose of the world, but they're coming at it from different vantage points. And what this means, just as an aside, what happened on this sixth day of creation, the day that man was created? Yes, the world was already extant, but the purpose of the world, it wasn't present till the, till the arrival of Adam. Comes along Adam, and Adam, uh, mankind, our actions and our choices have the ability to impact on the scope and the breadth of God's kingdom. And we did benefit as a result. And the Midrash tells us that when Adam was created, he was created with such stature, such such uniqueness, that all the animals came to Adam and started bowing down to him. Right? Man is in the image of God. That means that both man and God can choose. They're not subject to any pre-programmed way of operating. And therefore, there was something so unique about Adam that the animals gathered around and determined, well, this must be God. And they started bowing down to him. And Adam said, no, no, you're mistaken. Let's go find the real God and let's together go bow down to him. And thus, on day six is when the world achieve a certain modicum of completion because now the purpose of the world was present and the role of man in achieving that was demonstrated. So, on one hand, you have the anniversary of man and the anniversary of the purpose of the world. And on the other hand, you have, as a result of that, by extension of that, the anniversary of of the time where God became king, not just a ruler. And thus, that is the spiritual energy of the day. And that is the spiritual energy that's being recaptured every year when we revisit the same day again. And that is the way to understand all these various different themes that we mentioned at the beginning. So, as a simple one, we blow the chauffeur. Well, what do you do when you want to herald the arrival of a new king? You take out the trumpets, you take out the chauffeur, and you blow it, and you announce it, and you have proclamations. Well, that's what the chauffeur is. That's one element of the chauffeur. Well, what about judgment? Well, if this is the anniversary of God's dominion, and every year this is renewed again, so it's almost as if every year is a new administration. Well, what happens when a new administration comes into power? They have to start evaluating who is positively contributing to the administration and should be kept on board for the next year and who is a negative, who who needs to be scrapped, who needs to be put away. And thus, every year on Rosh Hashanah, which is the anniversary of God's kingdom, there is a day of judgment. And three books are opened, the books of the righteous, the books of the wicked, and the books of the in-between, so partially righteous and partially wicked. Well, what does it mean? What does it mean to be partially righteous and partially wicked? The answer is that someone has dual allegiances. A human can choose to embrace God or can use can choose to embrace idolatry. What's our idolatry? Our idolatry is not genuflecting to figurines in the corner of the room. Our idolatry is rejecting God by having something which is of greater priority on our totem pole. So anything that someone says, oh, I can't do that for God. That's more important than God. How could I come study? I have the uh, the football game. Or I, I, I cannot miss the trip to uh, soccer practice. I have to drive on Shabbos. Whatever it may be, any priority that supersedes God. Well, that's exactly what idolatry was. It's making God lower on the list of priorities than another, than another entity. And therefore, we we may indeed accept God as as the as as the creator theoretically, but on Rosh Hashanah we're judged, do we really accept God as king 
or do we have any other allegiances that are equal or even greater than that? And therefore, we're judged, and it's very terrifying. And there's a famous uh, ominous section of the prayer where we we mention plainly, you know, who's going to live and who's going to die. And the people they, that die, how exactly are they going to die? And we also pray for our prosperity. This is the time where the stature of a person and the well-being of that person, well, that's going to be determined on Rosh Hashanah. The Talmud tells us, on Rosh Hashanah, every human passes before God like sheep being counted one at a time, or like soldiers heading to war and being counted, or when you have a very narrow road and it can only be passed along single file. What that means is, is that when we're judged, we're judged alone. There's nothing else besides for us. When we self-judge, there's excuses for everything. And we take that with us when we want to judge ourselves. You know what comes with us when we get judged before God? Nothing. We're like the sheep being counted. It's only us. No other items. We can't blame our spouses or our parents or a terrible boss or nothing. We're on our own. We're a sole individual. We're like Adam. It's just Adam. And we have the same responsibility that Adam has. Even though Adam was an amalgam of all of humanity, but still, he was a human, we're a human, we're both tasked with the same role in bringing about the purpose of the world. And in Rosh Hashanah, we're evaluated as to how successfully are we in executing that job. And it's the time of the year that we we stop and we have to assess and analyze and critique and probe internally and to find out what is it that we are really living for. Are we living to try to bring about this purpose of creation? Or are we living for something else? And are we ignoring what the real ultimate purpose of life really is? We have to ask ourselves, who am I? What am I living for? And that's not very comfortable to do because no one wants to probe internally. It's not comfortable. It's scary. It's like listening to a voicemail with your own voice. It's too close for comfort. Even though the voice that we've heard more than any other voice in the world is our own, our relationship with ourselves has to be filtered through some process of justification. And therefore, when we hear ourselves as outsiders who could be more objective and aren't deceived by these inherent biases, it's uncomfortable. And we reject it, we resist it, we repel it. It's very difficult to do Rosh Hashanah properly. And one way that we are, or one tool that we could use to be more successful at it is the shofar. And the Rambam, famously in the chapter 3 of the Laws of Tshuva, he writes, quote, Even though the blowing of the shofar on Rosh Hashanah is a scriptural decree, there is a hint in it saying, Awake, O sleepers, from your sleep, and slumberers arise from your slumber. Examine your actions, repent, and remember your Creator. To those who forget the truth amid the nonsense of the time, and err the entire year with nonsense and emptiness that does not help nor save, inspect your souls, improve your paths and ways, and each one of them will abandon their improper path and thoughts that are not good. Why do we blow a show from Rosh Hashanah, says the Rambam? Well, the real reason is because the Torah says that's what you do. But there's a power that the shofar has to wake us up from our sleep and our slumber. We're asleep at life. We're not paying attention to the road. We spend too much time and focus and all the distractions. 
and we forget about the true purpose of life. Our lives indeed are in great peril. And the chauffeur is blown and hopefully he'll coax us to be awake. Every year, our family, we drive to, well, every year for the past couple of years, we've driven from Houston to Canada in the summer. And I do the bulk of driving in our minivan. And we choose to drive overnight and have the kids sleeping because it's easier to get a lot of ground, cover many miles overnight. But, of course, there's a great danger. And the great danger of someone who's driving by themselves with a tr- minivan full of children, full of souls, there's a tremendous danger driving overnight. And that is, what if you get distracted? Or, God forbid, you fall asleep. Think about the carnage of potentially what could happen from such an accident. Well, that's an exact parable of what we are doing, and I'm speaking to all of us, in our life. We're at the wheel of the most important journey of life. It's the purpose of everything, all of creation, all of the cosmos, the entire world, all of humanity, all the creatures, all this, everything. So man recognizes God and accepts God's dominion. And what happens? We're driving and we get distracted. And says the Ramam, our soul, our soul goes to sleep. And when our soul goes to sleep, there's no one at the wheel. There's nobody home. Who knows what could happen to this journey? Where is it going to lead? And of course, when is it most important for us to recognize this? On Rosh Hashanah. We take the shofar out. And the shofar is able to blow sounds that even though your physical ears can hear them and absorb them, its hallowed sounds can penetrate your soul too. And I encourage everyone to listen intently to the shofar and feel if you could feel something stirring within you. And the, ho- the hope is that your soul may indeed be asleep the entire year. It's not conscious. It's not vibrant. It's not alert. And during the whole year, we forget our creator. Our soul becomes to hibernate in, the, in our abyss. And hopefully the sounds of Rosh Hashanah, it will be aroused from its slumber. And indeed, hopefully remember its creator and realign its priorities in life and its paths in life and abandon the evil path. Evil here means and path that's not contributing towards achieving the purpose of the world. And this slumber, this sleep during this journey, well, it actually imperils our eternal life. And we take the chauffeur and we get roused from our slumber and we remember God and we realign and reorient and reframe our priorities in life, and hopefully our journey will be restored to safety. What else do we say in Rosh Hashanah? Who will live and who will die? We talk about all the gory forms of death that we could possibly have, by fire, by water, by animal, by sword. It's terrifying. And we say, the Talmud tells us, the books of the living and the books of the dead are open before him. And there's three books. And the people who get signed into the book of life, they go straight to life. And the wicked, straight to death. And the in-betweeners, well, they're putting a wait and see. And our religion doesn't focus on death with, with such attention, generally. And it's ironic that on the birthday, on the anniversary of the birthday of mankind, when mankind began, began life, we focus on the inevitable demise and the death. And the idea being is that death or contemplation on someone's own death, it too has the power to awaken us up from our slumber. The only reason why we're asleep at the wheel, the only reason why we have misaligned priorities is because 
we get duped into thinking that we'll live forever. That we don't consciously think that, but we don't think otherwise. And therefore, we spend the time to ruminate on your own death and think about that. And once you realize that your life over here is temporary and your permanent existence is that of a soul, well, that's a great antidote to fighting this cause of sleep, this cause of slumber. And on Rosh Hashanah, when it's so important for us to not miss out on this day, to not utilize it to reinvent ourselves and recreate ourselves and to redirect ourselves and become great people that we can and we ought to be, it's too dangerous to stay asleep. It's too dangerous to not have the sobriety. And we therefore, we need to absolutely crush the misconception that the world is an end unto its own. And we think about this, we think about our death, and it's, yeah, it's not comfortable, but it shatters the illusion that causes us to be asleep at the wheel. It's the death knell to the mistaken and disastrous attitude that causes our problem to begin with. And thus, perhaps we could say, this is why on Rosh Hashanah, when it's the time for us to think about our renaissance, our, our, our being reborn. This is the day most apt for newness, for recreation, for rebirth. It's also the day where we think about our death. Because when you think about your death, it can entirely inspire you to live life anew. And I would say just to just to go back to the point we mentioned earlier. Rosh Hashanah is one of the ten days of repentance. But there's no mention of sin. And this, again, dovetails with our previous understanding of the holiday, of the festival. It's a time of renewal. It's a time of examination of our life's priorities. And it's a time of reconnecting with our Creator, with our King. Why do we sin? Why do we reject when God tells us to do something and we say no? Or God says don't do something and we say we're doing it anyhow? That is all symptoms of the core problem and that we don't accept God as king and we don't accept ourselves as being subjects who are beholden to him. Therefore, Rosh Hashanah, indeed it is repentance. It's not repentance while pointing out specific sins, but it's repentance for what is the underlying, undergirding element of our distance from God, and thus our causing us to sin. And thus we talk about God's kingdom and God's dominion, and the fact that we're not going to live forever, and the fact that death exists, and the fact that we're judged, and all these come together on this holiday. And indeed, we're not going to mention sin per se, but the first step of addressing sin, and really the first step of causing sin, all lies within someone's relationship with their Creator. And thus, on Rosh Hashanah is a day we're we're renewing the relationship with God, we're reconnecting with what it is that we are here for? What is the purpose of our creation? Why do we exist? And thus, it's the time for us to take that lesson to to heart, to awaken our dormant soul from within us, and to commit ourselves to being worthy subjects, subjects of our King, of our Creator, of the Almighty, and hopefully, Uh, On Rosh Hashanah, we will be sealed swiftly into the book of life, into the book of prosperity, into the book of health, into the book of good tidings, not only for ourselves, but for our brethren, Jewish people, for our brethren in Israel. And it's the time, hopefully, that we take something out of this, this experience to 
examine the prayers, try to integrate them, to not just say them, but to try to find a way, uh, an avenue, a portal to take their lessons and bring them to heart. And by doing that, hopefully, the new us, the new you, the new me that we are recreating spiritually on Rosh Hashanah is someone that is much closer towards being the person who is fulfilling the role and the responsibility, the purpose of what, why we're created for in a more uh, admirable way. Everyone should have a Shana Tova Mituka, a happy and healthy, sweet new year. I look forward to seeing you and talking to you in next year.